conversation. As Jason said, my name is Sveta. I'm the data leaders, literacy librarian at DePaul University and a member of the uh, InfraLit Summit Planning Committee. And I have the honor of um, introducing um, Dr. Miriam Sweeney, um, our keynote presenter today. Uh, Dr. Sweeney is an associate professor in the School of Library and Information Studies at the University of Alabama, um, where she conducts research on um, critical uh, digital media studies, focused on the intersections of uh, race and gender, and the design and use of information communication technology, uh, thinking through how um, things like artificial intelligence, voice interfaces, virtual assistants, and um, data surveillance technologies are also sites of uh, corporate and state power. Um, her keynote today, uh, Facing Our Computers, Algorithmic Liter Liter Literacies as Practice, um, is a call um, to pay attention to our current technological environment, um, our reliance, um, increasingly so, on algorithmic technologies, um, and to understand that in the broader social, political, and economic landscape that we find ourselves in. Um, it's an invitation uh, to think about how facing our computers and developing these critical literacies is a way to reflect on our own position um, and to help um, LIS professionals um, expand the conversation around algorithmic culture and our teaching of information literacy so that we can better um, act towards a collective, a uh, better collective future. Um, so we're so happy um, to have you here and we're still looking forward to your talk. Uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Sweeney um, and uh, see you all again at the Q&A. Excellent, all right, thanks so much. Give me one moment and I will share the screen. Um, this is the dance that I know we're all familiar with at this point with the Zoom environment. So let me go ahead and do that. All right, there we go get myself oriented here. Okay, hi everyone. Um, I am not going to be monitoring the chat very closely while I'm talking, so Sveta will be helping with that. So at the end, we will definitely do some Q&A and I look forward to um, hearing from all of you, um, but if I don't immediately address you, then I am just focused on uh, the task at hand for a second. So let me just say, uh, first of all, greetings. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out and attending. I was floored when um, I was told about how many attendees were registering for this and from all over the place. And of course, you're all introducing yourself in the chat. So um, just thank you. That's amazing to have that kind of interaction this morning. Um, it really is an, an, an honor to be invited to speak with you all here at the summit. And I know that this is a very busy time of the semester for many of us. I was just uh, telling the presenters that this is our finals week coming up here. So we have a lot happening, um, but it's really a pleasure to kind of step away and speak with you all. I wanna take an opportunity also to extend my sincere gratitude to the organizers. So Jason, Christine, Sveta, Jen, Jill, Feruza, and everyone else involved for their hard work planning this event and also for their generosity of time and meeting with me in anticipation of the talk. I have rarely encountered such thoughtful planning committee and it truly makes all the difference in really feeling welcomed into this community of librarians. So thank you so much for that. Okay, let me go ahead and get into this. So to start off, I want to give a general overview of the kind of research I conduct to give you a sense of my approach to this conversation. Um, I am not an academic librarian, I don't play one on TV, and I only was an academic librarian very, for a very short period, maybe a year of my life before um, working in other contexts, public libraries predominantly, nonprofits, museums, um, and, and now um, as you know, predominantly in research and, and teaching roles um, in a, a faculty position. So um, I want to give you a sense of where I'm coming from. So as Sveta mentioned, I do critical digital media and information research, um, which uh, for me often looks at the design and interfaces of technologies, particularly those that are designed um, in an anthropomorphic way, right? So those that are designed to kind of look or act like people. So things like virtual assistants, voice interfaces, um, AI through the lenses of gender, race, and sexuality are my particular interests. And um, as Sveta mentioned, my current projects really are looking at explorations between you know, identity and the design of these technologies and also surveillance um, and how these things all come together in um, how AI voice assistants, digital assistants and chatbots are, are presented and what that means. So um, 
I would assume most of you are pretty familiar with the digital assistant environment. I know a lot of my students when I talk to them have an Amazon Alexa or a Google Home or a something, right? I assume um, many of you do too. Um, so that is the kind of technology I'm talking about, right? AI digital assistants like Amazon Alexa, predominantly voice-based interfaces that are accessing a variety of services, applications, and different information platforms using that personalized conversational interaction with users. Um, and of course, they can be accessed through things like smart speakers, like your Amazon Echo, for instance, or Google Home, but they also might be accessed through mobile devices, search interfaces, um, you know, internet of things, technologies, right? The smart home, all of that as well. So really we're talking about like a, a data assemblage, a, a suite of technologies, um, with a common interface point. And these technologies, um, though they were sort of first introduced as domestic technologies and personal technologies in the home, um, we're seeing them kind of migrate out to be interfaces for customer service, um, you know, search engines, education settings, e-government, healthcare, and libraries. Um, so, you know, it's interesting to kind of watch that expansion into from kind of like the personal home environment um, into these public spaces or workspaces, right, where there might be different expectations, different user groups, um, different privacy considerations. And um, yeah, so a little bit about the specific projects, the images on this slide depict some of my previous research on digital assistance. Um, on, on specific digital assistants. So for instance, I did my dissertation work on Microsoft's sexy search engine, Ms. Dewey. I don't know if you remember Ms. Dewey. Uh, she was a viral marketing campaign from Microsoft in 2006. So it's been a minute, uh, but she was around for a little bit and you might recognize actress Janina Gavinkar from like the L word, for instance, she's in a number of sci-fi shows. Um, she kind of got her start uh, doing odd gigs and one of them was being Ms. Dewey. Ms. Dewey would interact with you and call up search terms and flirt with you and all sorts of things. So there's like an interesting interplay of like identity that was working there to draw users in. Um, the next picture is the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services Digital Assistant, Emma, uh, presented as an ideal citizen that engages with you and answers your questions about immigration processes on the website. And this was a project that I did in collaboration with Dr. Melissa Villanicolas, who's at the University of Rhode Island. Um, and also shout out to her and her work on Latina information history. Excellent work there, check that out. Um, but we took a look at several different digital assistants that were designed as Latinas, because that's not the norm. Mostly the digital assistants that you see on the market are actually designed as um, well as, as either um, they're voiceless, but they're kind of coded as white middle class women, or they are explicitly designed in that way. So it's interesting to look at areas where that's not happening and kind of ask questions about, you know, what's going on with that, right? So in the case of Emma, um, looking at the way she embodies a particular kind of Latina identity, um, as she is, you know, uh, ushering in new uh, or you know immigration requests and things was sort of an, an interesting exploration and then um, similar to that the last image is a airport worker hologram that is used by various airlines and also tsa services which um, also has a, a line of latina looking and coded spanish-speaking um, uh, avas that are uh, positioned in border regions, right? So the, the ones that are positioned in like border uh, Mexico, US regions are Latina design. So we looked at that as well and um, traced how the marketing of those technologies actually is very, uh, very closely mimics how um, other kinds of uh, labor, historical labor projects with Latina workers in, for instance, maquiladoras and things. So that work is recently out as well. And then, of course, the smart home devices like Alexa or Amazon speak, Echo Speaker, et cetera. Um, so these are the kinds of things that I look at and you maybe are getting a sense of the kinds of questions that I'm asking about them as well. At the core, even though these look like different technologies, they actually have a lot in common with how they process information and provide assistive experiences, but they really range in the design and the presentation in other interesting ways. Uh, that raise questions about how these designs might be imagined to connect with particular users 
and for particular uses. That's kind of where I enter with my research questions. Um, so I've been, you know, particularly focused on ways that gender and race are strategically used as design choices that signal um, a bunch of sort of meta social and cultural conversations um, and also shape the interpretation and meaning of these devices. And that includes facilitating um, buy-in for these fairly invasive technologies, you know, things like your Alexa that are in your home that collect a lot of personal and intimate data about us, our environment, and our networks, right? So that's a really intimate thing, but but it's personable, but it's funny, but it's fun, but it's kind of a game, right? All of those kinds of designs help the user have um, a friendly and more trustworthy experience. Um, I have questions about what constitutes friendliness and trust, right? So those are the kinds of things I study. Rather than going really deep into the specifics of some of these examples, which I could do, of course, but let's let's rein it in. Um, I'm going to focus on some bigger picture issues that I've identified over the course of conducting this research over nearly 10 years that is relevant to our conversation about algorithmic literacies. No doubt, though, we will revisit some of these examples throughout our talk, and I might return to them as um, you know a kind of context where I can play out some of these ideas. So the theme for this conference is Expanding the conversation, digital media and civic literacies in and out of the library. Okay, I love this theme. It's already framed as growth oriented and it invites new perspectives and ways of knowing or understanding the interplay of digital media technologies and literacies. It also seems to invite us to metaphorically step outside our institutional spaces and consider the larger social and cultural ecosystems that we and our technologies are situated within. So great job organizers, wonderful, uh, wonderful theme for the conference. So when I'm talking about um, stepping outside into that cultural ecosystem, um, I mean a lot of things, right? We are currently living in a social and political moment characterized by the intersecting crises of climate change, a global pandemic, persistent racial inequality, the rolling back of hard-won civil rights, attacks on LGBTQ rights, um, entrenched economic disparity, and critical labor issues like the Great Resignation, right? So of course, this moment is also a culmination of historic precedents that implicate structures and processes of colonialism, globalization, heteropatriarchy, white supremacy, and capitalism. It's all in the mix. Right. And so technology is actually part of this milieu um, as well in complex ways, um, not just, you know, new, um, you know, uh, artificial intelligence or algorithmic technologies, but technology through the ages has always been intertwined with these processes. And so it's not a simple cause and effect kind of way either. Um, uh, so warning, this will not be a discussion with neat answers. <laughs> I will definitely raise more questions than answer things. Um, so that's just a caveat. But, um, but understanding the interconnectedness of this milieu and how technology fits into it, particularly algorithmic technology, since that's the focus of our talk today, points us to bigger questions about the information environment that shapes much of LIS practice in our personal and professional lives. So. In this sense, um, my talk, the title, Facing Our Computers, Algorithmic Literacies as Praxis, is a call to turn our attention to the current technological environment characterized by an increased reliance on algorithmic technologies and grapple with it as part and parcel of that broader social, political, and economic landscape that I just mentioned. Borrowing from Paolo Freire, um, a favorite um, of many, including mine, borrow from Freire's definition of praxis as reflection and action directed at the structure to be transformed, I invite us to consider how facing our computers, um, in other words, developing critical algorithmic literacies as a reflective tool, might help LIS, quote, expand the conversation around algorithmic culture in our professional capacities in order to better formulate actions and responses that lead us to better collective futures and for our communities and ourselves. Okay, so 
that's a tall order for today. We're just going to, you know, to scratch the tip of the iceberg on that. Um, but I like to set out a bold agenda for us to consider. So I want to start by acknowledging, and this is the right crowd for it, since this is the Information Literacy Summit, that concepts of literacy and literacies are contested conversations. Um, and I will secondly acknowledge that for some, the trend of appending the word literacy after various media is often viewed as cringy and overdone. Duly noted, right? Um, I know that we can debate the merits of information literacy versus data literacy versus algorithmic literacy, um, but today that is not my goal. <laughs> for the purposes today, I'm gonna leave those debates to the side, maybe to some breakout sessions later on, and intend instead to just borrow the term algorithmic literacies as a shorthand for referring to the frameworks, knowledge, and context needed to critically analyze and interpret algorithmic mythos, technologies, and culture. Um, and we will spend some time talking about all those things. Algorithmic literacy as an emerging concept has been recently defined by Drogrul, Masur, and Jokul as being aware of the use of algorithms in online applications, platforms, and services, knowing how algorithms work, being able to critically evaluate algorithmic decision-making, as well as having the skills to cope with or even influence algorithmic operations. I think this is a pretty good definition. Um, this and other similar definitions primarily seem to focus though on algorithmic use, bias, and evaluation. And while these are very important facets um, of algorithmic culture to critically examine, they often stay quite narrow in how they're applied and interpreted and may inadvertently recenter the mystique of the technology that we're trying to actually demystify in some ways and also in ways that elide the greater social, political and economic milieus that I referenced earlier. So if we're thinking about expanding that conversation, um, you know, I, I want to I want to keep keep expanding it um, outside of that a little bit. So, uh, for my own uh, inspiration, right, I draw on the robust emerging scholarship of colleagues uh, like Safia Noble, who's uh, whose uh, book Algorithms of Oppression. I'm sure um, I'm sure you are all familiar with, um, and if you're not, you should go order that immediately. Uh, Meredith Broussard whose book Artificial Unintelligence is also um, a wonderful gift that kind of breaks down um, really how uh, artificial intelligence works and what kinds of um, you know, fallacies we have about it. Kathy O'Neill, who's been featured a lot for weapons of mass destruction, looking at things like um, algorithmic discrimination and hiring practices and such. Kate Crawford's new book, Atlas of AI, is fantastic for kind of detailing the human and environmental impacts of um, AI technologies. Sarah Roberts, who looks at the humans behind your computer uh, and content moderation. Simone Brown, who traces the uh, histories of, um, of, of racial profiling and discrimination in facial recognition technologies and other filmic technologies. Mara Hicks, who looks at you know, gender and transgender issues in uh, information history and algorithmic culture, and, and the list goes on, right? This is not exhaustive. Um, but, but these folks and many others draw on critical cultural and sociological traditions and frameworks that interrogate the power asymmetries, inequalities, and the true human and environmental costs of algorithmic culture and technologies. So that's a really big picture, like lots of different angles on that. So again, no doubt you're familiar with some of these, maybe all of them, I don't know. If not, I highly recommend them to adding to your summer reading lists. So, Okay, so what do we mean when we say algorithmic culture? I've said it several times and I think it's worth um, thinking through a definition for that. Uh, I really like this definition that Ted Stripkoff offers. He says, over the last 30 years or so, human beings have been delegating the work of culture, the sorting, the classifying, and hierarchizing of people, places, objects, and ideas, increasingly to computational processes. Such a shift significantly alters how the category culture has long been practiced, experienced, and understood, giving rise to what, following Alexander Galloway, he calls algorithmic culture. 
So following that, he offers a punchline. He says, what's at stake in algorithmic culture is the gradual abandonment of culture's publicness and the emergence of a strange new breed of elite culture purporting to be its opposite. So there's a lot to take in here. Um, the first part, this the quote I have on the slide, is really reminiscent of the kinds of power structures that I think, you know, um, the LIS greats, you know, Bowker and Starr talk about in sorting things out, you know, thinking about the power of classification and, um, you know, the radical catalogers um, um, of, our, of our past and present, um, Sandy Berman, Hope Olson, folks like Kara Roberto, right, are thinking about uh, Melissa Adler. Um, the second part, though, the, the stakes in terms of the publicness and the emergence of a new breed of elite culture uh, is really reminiscent of, of conversations I know we have in the field about, um, you know, the kind of disappearance of the public domain, um, the movement of public uh, of, of goods and services from the public sphere to the private sphere, that kind of shift towards privatization. And that's definitely at play here. And it's not only privatization, but kind of becoming also like that black box phenomenon where the transparency is really lost in the process as well. So with algorithmic culture, it's not only that we have kind of a new logic of sorting and classifying, but also that, that becomes, um, you know, kind of hidden and owned uh, and proprietary in a way that makes it, you know, unassailable, like you can't question it or interrogate it because it's no longer, you know, it's no longer out in the open. Um, so in other words, algorithmic culture has a cohesive suite of logics and ideologies that undergird it as an organizational framework and lead to distinct outcomes in favor of pre-existing power structures. These logics present themselves as common sense and unassailable, as I just said. So some of the ideologies that emerge are, uh, you know, it's just math, right? Like, the idea that computational processes are viewed as de facto objective or neutral, scientific, efficient, right, reliable, rather than, you know, messy human interlocutors who have things like bias and, uh, and who are maybe not rational and inefficient, right? Um, so the it's just math ideology emer emerges um, to, to justify, right, algorithmic culture. Um, it's better. Uh, this is an ideology that Broussard talks about a lot in her book. Uh, techno chauvinism is the term she uses for this the idea that technology is always the solution, that you've got a problem. Um, I'm, I'm really resisting making a vanilla ice joke right now, but um, if you've got a problem, technology will solve it. Okay, I made the joke, whatever, it's fine. Uh, so, yeah, so techno chauvinism is kind of like this idea that technology is always better, it will always solve your problem. Um, it's abstract. There's no people. Um, this ideology is like, it tells us that humans are removed from the process. We can kind of abstract out from people and that data also becomes abstracted out from people and then kind of functions like free flowing, like a natural resource, kind of unattached. You can just use it, right? Um, so the abstraction is really important. And uh, Kate Crawford talks about this as abstraction and extraction, that they're kind of twin processes that work together. So as we, as we are extracting, we are also abstracting away as well. Um, and then the last one is that it's inevitable um, that you know, technological advancement is an unstoppable path and we might as well just kind of get on board with it now, right? Um, I hear this over and over again. It's very hard to disrupt this kind of logic. Um, I hear students say all the time, you know, well, I mean, it's gonna happen anyway, like someone's gonna invent that or like this is coming, right? So there's a real like sense of inevitability that we are on this train that we can't, we can't stop. Um, but I think that part of what we're talking about today in terms of algorithmic literacy is trying to see differently, right? Seeing this differently. So um, Kate Crawford has described artificial intelligence, for instance, as a register of power. And it's fair to say that we might describe algorithmic culture as the rationale that animates and legitimizes that power. With this perspective, we can push back on this rationale and ask new questions, seeking new outcomes and answers, seeing differently. So it's just math becomes science and technology are socially shaped. Um, AI systems both reflect and produce social relations and understandings of the world. We can see it differently. It's better for whom, right? 
Elon Musk just bought Twitter. Uh, and for whom is that better, right? Why do we have billionaires? So many questions, right? For whom is it better? Who is the subject and who is the object, you know, for these systems? Who do they act on um, and who do they act for? Uh, it's the abstract, no people. Your computer is people, people all the way down, right? Like turtles all the way down. Wherever you go with your computer down the, you know, down the rabbit hole of exploration, it's people. People are making it, they're mining it, they're assembling it, you know, they're involved in coding, they're involved in assembly, they're involved in, um, in, uh, in content moderation. Um, many processes that we think of as fully automated, in fact, have humans, you know, adjudicating different kinds of outcomes um, and shifting outcomes in different ways. So, so no, it's just people. And lastly, it's inevitable. Well, science and technology studies tells us that it could always be different. Um, often the it's inevitable obscures all of the conflict and the contestation that goes through technological innovation. Innovation is not linear. It doesn't, you know, start here and just go up neatly. It's, a, it's you know, it, it's, it goes all over the place. Um, you know, I mean, I have my computer and I have a pencil on the table, right? Like we have a lot of different things happening at one time. It's not that neat. And it's also, you know, in its own cultural context, there's political elements to why certain technologies are adopted or economic elements and others are not. So, um, so nothing's inevitable. It is, um, it is all cultural and social and political and economic processes wound together. Right? So I would offer this as, um, these as transformational goals then for cultivating algorithmic literacies would be to seek to understand and disrupt the consolidation and reproduction of power that is facilitated by these technological regimes. Um, see it differently, disrupt that, right? See that uh, this isn't uh, neutral or, or naturally occurring, that it is in fact a system, a system with rules and logics and rationale, but a system nonetheless. And we can bring different rationale, different logics to that system and see different outcomes. Okay. Okay. So let's see. Um, algorithmic literacies might include all kinds of things, really. Um, this is a non exhaustive list. Um, I'm not going to be able to go into detail about all of these aspects today. Uh, read those summer book recs for that deep dive. But I do want to explore elements of these items as they pertain to some of my areas of research with digital assistance and AI smart technologies. Um, algorithmic literacies might include, you know, for expanding that conversation, an understanding of the human and environmental costs of AI technologies. Um, so kind of, you know, moving spheres out from the application at hand. Um, an understanding of how it works, right? Separating the myth from the reality. Um, I find that that's actually um, a wonderful place to start and actually a source of great uh, misunderstanding, right? What can these technologies actually do and how do they actually work versus how do we think they work and how do we, like how are we kind of told their work based on our you know, engagement with fiction, um, which is wonderful for imagining but not always accurate in reflecting the actual process. Um, understanding how algorithmic systems encode and reproduce power in different ways is very important. That does touch on the conversation around bias and discrimination that I know has been um, you know, really dominant in the AI ethics area. Although I think there are more dimensions to that than just thinking about it through the lens of bias. Um, it, that's one lens, there are, there are others. Um, attendance to the particular harms and impacts of algorithmic decision-making on marginalized and disenfranchised people globally. So a lot of the books that I recommended are speaking to you know, different kinds of um, populations or different kinds of harms in different institutional contexts. Um, and that's kind of what I mean by that. And then lastly, exploration of alternatives, including resistance and refusal. Can we imagine you know, different kinds of configurations um, to meet our needs in ways that don't uh, require us to compromise or our patrons or our students or our communities to compromise so much of themselves in order to engage, so. Okay, I'm just checking to make sure we're good on time and everything. Okay, great. Okay, um, worrying about the right thing. Something, um, something I want to talk about is, uh, you know, should we worry? And the answer is like, yes, but ab about 
the right things and not the wrong things. Um, so what I mean by that is Johnson and Verdicchio note that there seem to be many common misunderstandings and anxieties about how AI might spin out of control and harm humans and society in disastrous ways. And they cite three main factors that contribute to AI anxieties. So one is what they call socio-technical blindness. Um, and that is when uh, folks tend to abstract AI like out of its context of existence and use and ignore the fact that, you know, it's like human beings and institutions and social arrangements that give AI its capacity to do or mean anything. Like AI doesn't just like float freely out there. It's being used in an institutional context, right, around particular sets of um, of guides and actors. So socio-technical blindness kind of ignores that and, and treats AI like it's just happening in, you know, a, a clean room or something. Um, confusion about autonomy. Thinking about AI as autonomous, but not thinking much about what counts as autonomy is what they mean by that. So particularly that, um, you know, if uh, artificial intelligence is meant to sort of metaphorically mimic human intelligence, you can't take it too literally because um, autonomy and intelligence in computational entities is really different from autonomy in humans and intelligence in humans. Like it literally works very differently. Um, so that's fine as a metaphor, but when we're talking about like how that technically works, uh, they often get conflated with each other. So when we're talking about computational autonomy or computational logic, um, that, that is different, it's a, it works separately. Technological development, um, one of the anxieties around this is that, you know, there's an inaccurate conception that te technological development is going to like, you know, jump forward to these immediate future scenarios and like this end point um, without sort of thinking about like the fact that, you know, in, you can turn on a, a tech dystopia and like, boom, you're there in the midst of whatever crisis is happening. But in the real world, you experience the steps that go up to the crisis, right? So um, technological development is when you kind of neglect that, you know, it's kind of jumping to the, the future time without taking into account how you get there. So ironically, there are many good reasons to be anxious about AI and many real world present day harms that are experienced by people and the planet because of AI as we speak. Um, things like racial profiling, hiring discrimination, predictive policing, depletion of the earth's raw materials um, are just a few, right? Like be anxious about that. That is a real pressing thing. However, um, understanding the parameters of how AI and algorithmic processes of different kind of work is necessary to distill fact from fiction and then accurately trace the impacts of these technologies as they exist in the here and now. So uh, we want to worry, but we want to worry about the right things and have the skills to note the difference of that. Okay, so uh, so kind of turning into looking at um, how this particularly applies to some areas of my work, I want to um, talk a little bit about the, the, the big data environment. One part of algorithmic literacy is facilitating an understanding of the broader data environment as a landscape that was actively built, continually invested in, and maintained through technical, legal, economic, and political partnerships. In other words, big data didn't just happen to us. Big data was, um, was a system that was built and maintained and invested in. Okay. Understanding that can help us see the infrastructure parts of the questions um, that lead us to new questions about governance, regulation, ownership, all these things. So the big data turn. The development of artificial intelligence and machine learning was dependent on the growth of cost-effective and scaled-up computing infrastructures, things like cloud computing, server storage, data processing, right? Um, which I know you all are familiar with because you all deal with these things all the time. Um, and, and these were the necessary components to create conditions for compiling and mass, uh, compiling and mining massive data sets. So in some ways it feels like a little tautological since big data like required data, but then to get the data it needed data, you know, to scale up. It's kind of like a chicken and egg situation. But as you can see, um, the growth of this enterprise required many factors to come together 
all these things listed on, on the slide, right? All these advances kind of come together at the same time, lowering the cost um, of, of scaled up computing, for instance, at the same time as um, advances in some of these technologies like machine learning, natural language processing. Um, and a lot of this depended on and was only possible because of large federal funding from ARPA, which gave us, you know, ARPANET, the uh, early internet, Department of Defense, um, the use of public infrastructures, so taxpayer dollars were very integral to this, uh, permissive regulatory structures that, um, you know, allowed companies, uh, companies and, um, and university structures, you know, kind of free reign to, to trade information and share data um, and to use data, data that was available. And also private infusions of capital, venture capital, to keep all of this afloat. So um, that's a that's a lot of investments, right? That come together of different kinds. So we're led to kind of, I think, I think we're. This is not something we talk about um, publicly all so much that like this was an infrastructure that was uh, really invested in at numerous levels. Uh, and where did the data come from? I mean, there's kind of like rounds of, um, of developments, you know, like the first um, rounds of developments for like natural language processing, for instance, were happening in the 50s at Bell Laboratories. Um, the machine known as Audrey, the automatic digit recognizer um, could recognize the digits nine to zero or zero to nine with 90% accurate accuracy, but only if spoken by its inventor, right? So that was a very limited Alexa moment in the 50s. But that was very impressive for the time, right? And it took a huge amount of computing infrastructure like racks and racks of technology to support that. Um, the second round of, of, of big innovation and jumps in development happened in the 80s. Um, another round of US government funding, um, an infusion of funding was happening in the 80s, um, you know, likely kind of a Cold War push to develop some of these technologies leading to another as kind of a second renaissance and speech recognition. So um, widely available data sets and benchmarks enabled measurement and comparison of different systems resulting in a lot of competition and progress during this time. Um, one of the biggest factors in this progress was that the National Bureau of Statistics uh, and Standards or Standards, which is now called NIST, um, was a big clearinghouse for researchers trying to benchmark the performance of their code. Um, so a lot of progress was made between groups like MIT and Bell Labs and other groups, you know, Carnegie Mellon, et cetera. And so what we get are these large data sets, um, for some of them created through uh, publicly available things, like we have the Penn Tree Bank, which was a project in the 90s that selected um, like over, you know, 2,000 stories from a three-year Wall Street Journal collection and did syntactic in, in, uh, annotation on it so it could uh, you know, you know, learn uh, relationship and semantic models. Um, other things included the Enron corporate corpus. So the Enron emails, over 600,000 emails generated by 158 employees of Enron leading up to the company's collapse in 2001 became a huge data set that was training data. And then also things like the ferret database, which uh, NIST was uh, developing themselves serves as a standard database of facial images for research to develop over the years. So this, in, including other kinds of public data, um, in, you know, criminal records, mugshots, things like that, became, um, became the benchmark data that this technology is trained off of. So um, in some sense, data is and always was just us, right? The third wave of innovation in this technology, sort of the, the era of like neural nets, um, which pushed forward, you know, the technologies that give us Alexa, like the, the modern voice assistants, um, rest on these deep infrastructures um, in the form of user engagement and interaction. Like, so now we, we are out there engaging in social media, posting on the internet, talking to Alexa, generating more data, right? data generation and extraction all around us. We have intertwined work, play, love, family, health, education, social services, government, and consumption um, around a system that requires that we give of ourselves in the form of data to feed it back. Our social connection and person, our social connections 
and purchasing and information needs are data mined to continue optimizing these systems that refine marketing, surveillance, and things like criminal profiling, right? Um, there's so many impacts around life opportunities and choices and, uh, and differential outcomes that are determined through this data that um, is, is just us engaging socially every day. And in fact, when we're talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence, what we're really talking about are the ways that historic or past data sets with all their imperfections, biases, assumptions, and problematics become the blueprint for making future predictions about us. So whether we're likely to commit a crime, be credit worthy, achieve academically, be hireable, secure housing, be eligible for healthcare or insurance, or perform well at social tasks of different kinds. Um, it's, it's past data doing future predictions, right? So um, that data from like the Enron set is, you know, used to determine things, you know, about you now. Um, it's interesting. So it's like you can, I know that there's a, an author who I cannot recall the name of right now who wrote about ghost data, but the data that hangs around, right? And I think it's interesting to think about that. It's not just the data of the present, but it's, you know, in the same way that we're talking about archives and archival potentials for creating the narratives of the future. Um, our data traces in this environment are doing the same thing for constructing our personage and our person personhood. And then intimate data context, you know, critically, as folks' everyday activities at home and work become more intertwined, we have, you know, we have these assemblages of smart technologies where the potential for like overt and covert data capture has really intensified. So we have these data networks like I mentioned before, smart technologies, Internet of Things, um, you know, your smart home, your your robot that maps your house, you know, your smart thermostat, whatever, um, mobile phones, mobile devices, smart watches, personal computers, household appliances, um, children's toys that are connected to I as IoT, automobile integration, home security systems like ring networks and things like that. And then from that, we get a tremendous like amount of kinds of data, right? There's biometric data. So things like voice recognition, facial recognition, and others, you might have blood pressure, heart rate, things like that. Sleep tracking, period tracking, uh, consumer habits, what you buy, what you click on, internet-based transactions of different kinds, personal and identity-based information, and then geographical information tracking as well. I'm sure there's more. Um, this capture of intimate user data over time creates extensive data archives that are reliant on cloud-based storage, private ownership of data, outsourced data processing, and data sharing across entities to function. So I wanna just say that again, because again, this environment has been constructed in a particular way it's reliant on the cloud, right? So servers, right? We can demystify the fluffy cloud, um, private ownership of data, outsourced data processing and data sharing across entities. So that's the precondition, right? For this environment, it is set up that way. Now, given the current information environment of the United States, which is characterized by pretty permissive surveillance policies, um, you know, around the USA Patriot Act, there's a real low to no barrier bar on accessing information for the state um, to a lot of data. I mean, we know that um, federal agencies uh, like ICE, for instance, uh, do ask for data from telecoms and from, um, from the big tech companies, uh, and that there's more of a policy of, of giving that data than, than fighting it. Like, it's easier to, to just give it and not um, to fight it. Um, and also, many of that comes with gag orders so that we don't even know, right? Um, and then there's a lot, there's um, very few policy frameworks for accountability or transparency with how user data might be used to, used by companies and traded to shape life, op life opportunities for people, perpetuate inequality, um, target particular vulnerable communities. Um, we know that happens, but there's not a great deal of regulation around it. So I know that we're sort of seeing now these, these big tech conversations about like, well, should, you know, Facebook be regulated? And they're like, no, we'll regulate ourselves, you know? And it's like, okay, well, that hasn't worked so far. Um, what else can we do here? So the EU has like a really different data situation. They have much more strict data uh, privacy policies. So, you know, it is interesting to look and compare different policy environments to see how those operate and 
you know, what, um, how that works for them and, you know, what, what, are, what, what we could imagine, right, could work for us. Um, unfortunately, because of the political entrenchments of some of that um, in the US, I, I'm not sure that model would go here, but um, I do think it's, it's important to look around and look at different models. Um, okay, so as our professional institutions continue to invest in data-driven initiatives that use these kinds of intimate data to evaluate things like student success um, in the educational environment or employee performance, right, it becomes crucial to understand how these data networks operate and are governed so we can push back as our own professional tools may be implicated in this environment as well. Okay, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here because I think we're getting kind of close to time and I wanna just move forward. Um, okay, let's see. So uh, the la one thing I'll say before I move to the next area is the data landscape has been largely, I think, and purposely occluded from people who are using and buying these technologies. Um, you know, as a consumer, we're encouraged to see these emerging technologies as fun and convenient and trustworthy and efficient, um, all those things, right? So we have, you know, controlled wake words for Alexa that are advertised as kind of like a playful convenience feature. And, you know, definitely there are assistive capabilities to this. So I don't want to downplay that. Although I do want to ask questions about whether we can have assistive technologies that aren't also, um, making that don't require the level of extraction and vulnerability with them, right? Whether that's a possibility. Um, but yeah, I see in increasingly new, dem new demographics for these technologies. Something I'm working on right now is um, looking at the way that the marketing gets so specific for things like Alexa. Like it, now we're seeing it targeted to like children in the home, right? So you have like Alexa kids um, with, with features. And of course, kids are a huge, you know, uh, advertising demographic. So that's um, interesting and something to watch. But then also the elderly are a big target as well. Um, there's a, a new, um, uh, what's it called? The Alexa Together, I'm trying to read my slide. There's the new Alexa Together service, which kind of extends older, um, like elder care systems, um, you know, like where you would have a, a life alert or something, but, but in like a, a more total surveillance way, like you can pop in and check on them, see what they're doing. And then like the targeting of it too is like, you know, eliminate senior moments, like tell Alexa where you stashed your homeowner's policy and she'll save that information for you. So, you know, there's just something in there about thinking about who is sort of vulnerable and um, in terms of this technology landscape. And even if there are conveniences that go with that, what are we giving up with those conveniences and can we demand more, you know, can we demand better um, in this environment? Okay, I'm gonna slide forward a bit here. Um, one thing is where does this data go? Uh, transparency is not a real big part of this conversation from the uh, user and consumer vantage point. We do know that Amazon has partners with ICE and Homeland Security. They host the biometric data for ICE um, on Amazon Web Services. Um, and at the center of the criticism was the data mining company Palantir who, which designed the investigative case management system for ICE. So the ICM is a critical component for ICE's deportation operations. And it, you know, it, it integrates a vast ecosystem of public and private data to track down immigrants and seek to deport them. So this is to say that as we're looking at the investments of these companies who are kind of controlling the conversation, they are clearly invested and linked with um, law enforcement, with, um, you know, with, with federal immigration services um, in ways that I think should make us ask questions around um, what it means for us to sort of also invest in these technologies and what is, you know, safety concerns, power concerns, um, whose interests are really being observed. Yeah. Okay. I've got, okay, 25 minutes until nine to five. Okay, great. All right. Awesome. Thank you for keeping me on track in the chat box there. I'll keep that open so I can see. Okay, um, this is such an exciting conversation. I have so many things to say. Okay, um, increasingly we see, uh, we see libraries also, of course, be a space of interest, right? Education, healthcare, government, libraries. Yes, we're all in the space. And the capability of voice assistance to integrate across, across platforms 
um, which Alexa calls skills and Google calls actions, um, allows libraries to create specialized uses for these technologies as part of their regular information services. So, you know, third party vendors like Overdrive for ebook lending or Hoopla for multimedia lending and public libraries are pre configured to connect to voice assistants like Alexa. Um, Carrie Smith documented this trend in a 2019 American Libraries Magazine article, Your Library Needs to Speak to You, giving examples focused on school, public, and academic libraries that are adopting smart voice assistants um, and integrating them into a range of services and programming, including event calendars, catalog searches, holds, and advocacy. Um, Voice assistants um, are often presented in the trade literature for LIS as part of an exciting new wave of smart technology services that libraries can use to, you know, kind of get ahead of trends and, um, and potentially harness for public service and community engagement. But at the same time, privacy issues are often really downplayed as secondary concerns, and libraries are often you know, kind of uh, encouraged to press forward and just experiment along the way and kind of move those concerns to the back burner. Um, I did a study in 2019, sending a survey out across libraries nationally um, to see like, you know, how many libraries are really using these? I didn't get a ton of hits on use, but I also asked questions about whether librarians were like concerned about that at all. Um, and about half of the librarians that responded did say that they had some concerns, even if they weren't. Some of the libraries were checking out or using experimenting with um, with voice assistants in their libraries, but even the ones who weren't had interesting concerns um, about that, in, including privacy issues. So among those concerns, it was concerns about things like data access and use, you know, like who gets access to this data exactly and how might it be used or misused. They were concerned about, you know, the data being shared by different vendors um, and concerns with just not having kind of, you know, it being kind of out of their control. Um, concerned about surveillance, not just of patrons, but also of themselves as workers, you know, using these technologies in the library and kind of like heightening surveillance of everyone, including at the desk. Like if the device is at the desk, then it's also recording and hearing um, conversations among staff, perhaps, and things like that. Um, there were procedure and operational questions in terms of just like, you know, integrating technology does not always make our life easier. Someone has to maintain that and, uh, you know, troubleshoot that. <laughs> so just like the printer always jams, right? Your voice assistant is always going to have an issue to deal with. Um, other folks were concerned about legal issues in terms of, um, you know, where does this interplay with things like FERPA in an academic library or a school library? What are the liability of library workers if a patron's personal identi personally identifiable information uh, is misused or anything like that? And then others were just concerned about their professional responsibility, right? Um, professional responsibility in, in context of wanting to both protect patrons' privacy, but also one person was like concerned about their inability to protect privacy in this environment. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, Okay, kind of wrapping, wrapping, winding down this story. In the academic library, I, you know, there's a, a different ways that machine learning might be used. I think most likely search and discovery is kind of a big one, you know, kind of uh, making search and discovery processes more automated and um, creating, you know, metadata and analyzing big corpuses of data, uh, maybe location-based search, what have you. Um, the other big one that I, the other big trend that I found identified in the literature was, again, digital assistants and chatbots um, as a point of, um, as a point of, uh, of interaction with the public. And uh, the existing literature has a lot of um, familiar terminology around that, that, you know, well, they're available 24 seven and they're consistent and they're patient, right? Um, in all of my literature, looking at chatbots and digital assistants across different industries, the same language is used and is always connected to other kinds of histories around labor rights and um, wanting workers who aren't so messy as humans. Yes, and I'm seeing in the chat because I pulled that up, that is about what delegates to humans and what is left. That's absolutely correct. So there are some troubling labor things in here, and I would say that like we're not like alone that this is popping up in a lot of different spheres, but we should be attuned to that. Um, scholarly publishing, there's more like speculative things happening there about the ways that machine learning and um, artificial intelligence might be disruptive to the, pub the scholarly publishing way of doing things, you know, trying to maybe 
uh, direct content algorithmically uh, to researchers in different ways. Um, Skullcom folks, you know, run with that one. Um, not, not as much my area, but I wanted to put it up there. So questions for us, um, and I, I swear I'm wrapping up. Uh, algorithmic literacies then might be a reflective tool for finding new questions in this environment. Um, so we started with some questions, right, about like just, you know, how does it work? Is there bias, right? And I'm suggesting that, that this conversation and way of thinking about algorithmic literacies might open up more questions, right? So one is, are our patron communities, students, faculty, staff, the public, whomever, safe in our institutions? Are these communities represented in positive, robust, and empowering ways within these systems? So for instance, you know, the way that they are catalog classified and categorized within databases, search tools, catalogs, collections, resources. Do we have control over how their data is used? You know, like what, what promises can we really make um, about that? Can we imagine an educational landscape outside of algorithmic governance? Increasingly, that is quite hard to do, um, you know, especially in kind of the, the corporate academy structure uh, that we're in. Can we imagine developing technologies that would serve the professional goals and values of social responsibility, access, diversity, and the public good? In other words, in other words, technologies designed for those things, right? Not just to be more efficient or to optimize results or to do something faster, but uh, you know, what if we flipped that? And I know that other scholars, like folks like Sophia Noble, have been saying this for a long time. So I want to again shout out some of the existing work in this area. Um, and nod to all the good thinkers out there who have been thinking long and hard on these problems. How are our jobs positioned against the logics and the introduction of these new efficient systems? So again, kind of a labor question, where do we stand, right, in that picture? Benefits to whom, right? Uh, and who else across industries and institution types are having these questions and concerns? We're not alone, right? This is definitely a moment of, again, stepping out of our institutions and really surveying the landscape of what's happening. Um, and lastly, how do we use our skills to respond to these power structures? Uh, praxis is about response, right? It's about taking action on structures um, of inequality to disrupt them. And so ultimately the goal of algorithmic literacies, in my mind, is to intervene, right? It's not to optimize, it's to disrupt. Um, we have plenty of evidence um, to show that you know these technologies consolidate power, um, and and you know there there are many harms um, as we rush forward to these technologies and feel the pressure to really adopt them. Um, algorithmic literacies give us a new set of questions and a new orientation to think about uh, before advancing. Perhaps I would say that there's lots of opportunities for advocacy here. Um, I mean, you know, we can think of it at lots of different levels, and, and I would offer that work needs to happen at many different levels, right? Like wherever you are, there is work to be done. So start there, right? Um, but this leads us to thinking about what kinds of responses and actions we might envision. Um, so all, all levels, right? We can think about, you know, uh, ALA as a professional body. I know that we have different relationships to that professional body, and there's different ideas about how effective um, that might be, but that's an avenue is to, you know, to um, think about expanding privacy guidelines that specifically address the emerging ecosystem of ubiquitous surveillance technologies. Um, in my research, I found that, you know, a ALA does have privacy guidelines that addresses things like third party vendors, but they're not like the guidelines aren't really set up to address this changing ecosystem. And there could be more, right? So um, having more guidelines as a, a, a bargaining tool for you know, working with vendors uh, could be helpful with that. Also thinking about policy and policy can happen at lots of different levels, but I'm also thinking about like policy at the big level, like where's the responsibility and the regulation being aimed at um, the companies who it should be aimed at, right? Like we can be vigilant <laughs> for ourselves, but um, if these are structural issues, then it is the structures themselves that you know, need to change. So we have um, we have we have options sort of at the political level, you know, to think about um, what kinds of policy and regulation. I mean, I'm thinking about like the FCC and you know that kind of level, but also we can think about the way that policy 
um, has different levels and including institutional and state um, up to federal as well. And then, of course, community, I think that, um, you know, rather than thinking about uh, rather than thinking about global, you know, thinking about the local knowledge that we have, looking to community knowledge, and that includes the work of, uh, you know, of, of ongoing activism that's happening. People have been resisting this all along and doing that work every day. Um, and, you know, it's, it's time to, it's, we need to value that work um, in our communities, particularly listening to the folks who are uh, on the receiving end of targeting, marginalization, policing, right? Um, experiencing the effects of these technologies, like listen to them, believe them, support them in our institutions in different ways. Um, you know, it's interesting because, you know, in places like Oakland and San Francisco and Berkeley, like they've like, those cities have talked about like, and have um, some have banned facial recognition in those cities um, because, you know, Silicon Valley has like invented those technologies and knows they're harmful. And they're basically like, yeah, we don't want it to be used on us. You know, we're developing it. So it's sort of interesting. Um, and there's lots of reports that, that show like folks who have developed, you know, the, the digital assistants, things like Alexa themselves are like, oh no, I would never let my child use that, right? So uh, that's interesting. And we should listen to that too as a, and take that as kind of a canary in the coal mine um, that there might be some problems here. Uh, and also really interrogate again who is sort of developing this and who is who is using it. You know, there's a real uh, divide on that. Um, as we're uh, wrapping up, opportunities for collective action. I mentioned that earlier. Um, well, first of all, I see that you know since we're talking about Illinois, and thank you for hosting us virtually. I saw that the UIC GEO strike is suspended. That they got um, a contract and some retro pay and supportive measures for striking. So. Good job, everyone out there. Uh, I went to UIUC and uh, was part of the union there when I was a PhD student. And um, well done, folks. So there are opportunities for collective action. Um, recently, to the uh, Amazon Labor Union organizer, Christian Smalls, reacted to uh, you know a celebrating a victory of, um, of of the vote to unionize for Amazon, and this was huge because. Uh, Amazon has, is a huge union busting organization, right? Here in Alabama, um, that's happening just you know down the road, it feels like, um, at an Amazon warehouse here. So that's huge. And I, I you know put on the slide, it's a little hard to see, but you also have like climate change folks. There's a lot of solidarity amongst movements, right? There's folks who are striking, <clears throat> um, activists who are striking around for working conditions in the factories and in the Amazon uh, factories. And then there's folks who are, um, you know, protesting Amazon's uh, inability to do, uh, to, to change policies around climate change and environmentalism. So um, what we see, I guess, in, on this slide, and, and there's a picture of the UIC folks, or the UIC folks, there's, labor issues are labor issues. It doesn't matter what sector they're happening in. Like they're they're all the same issue, you know, because the labor rights, you know, a degradation of labor rights in one area is a degradation of labor rights for everyone. So I do think that um, thinking about the issues around, um, you know, I know this is not a new conversation, particularly with like vendor power and scholarly publishing. And I know that like, you know, thinking about how collective action can respond and refuse um, in that area. I think that there, I know that that's been hard to get traction on because of the power of those industries, but I think it's kind of like similar, like there are parallels with the big tech stuff. So I would just offer that, um, you know, we can see these as interrelated issues and then um, find new friends and partners that we can work across boundaries with because the issues are not just in libraries or, you know, whatever, um, they're issues that are all around. And then uh, informed refusal. Um, consider the radical deinvestment in big tech. Um, no technology is inevitable, right? We should keep pushing for alternative models that don't place people at risk. Um, I'm really inspired by the OA movement, and again, thinking about parallels with scholarly publishing. And uh, you know, I, obviously, there are still issues and challenges there, but I'm inspired by all of the work that's been done um, in developing. OERs and open repositories and IRs and all such all sorts of things. And I wonder, you know, what the potentials are for us in terms of thinking about uh, doing similar things with, um, you know, the technology suites that we're using, 
seems like the issue with the relationship with um, our publishers and with our tech vendors, you know, that we, as you see similar power dynamics at play there, and there might be some strategies and sharing across those that we can think about. The Feminist Data Manifest No, if you're not familiar with that, was led by fellow LIS folks, uh, Marika Sefor, uh, Patricia Garcia, Tanya Sutherland, um, uh, Anna Lauren Hoffman, uh, Anita Se Chan, Lisa Nakamura, Jennifer Road, uh, Nilo Far uh, Salahi. And uh, these folks put together this, this manifest no, which they describe as um, a way to remember. Yes, thank you for that. Remember to imagine and craft the worlds you cannot live without, just as you dismantle the worlds you cannot live with. Quoting Ruha Benjamin on that, another author I probably should have put on that slide, um, thinking about uh, the new Jim Crow and abolitionist technologies. Um, but I pulled out a few that I just wanted to share as kind of parting thoughts. One, she they said on their number 16 is, we refuse surveillance as the only condition for participation and to feel powerless in the face of inevitable mass technology surveillance. We commit to find communities, to hold them close, and to resist together. We refuse to see that convicting unjust institutions and disciplines to listen to us is the only way to make change. We commit to co-constructing our language and questions together with the communities we serve in order to build power on our own. So I find that very inspiring. Um, so I'll conclude here because there's you know, far too much more to say and too little time to do it. But I hope that this uh, conversation was generative and just thinking about expanding that conversation. Um, it may be frustrating because we didn't <laughs> get to any answers, but if you'll remember, I did not promise answers. I just promised questions. Um, but I think the takeaway here is that there's tremendous opportunities for librarians to lead by example in collaboration with community stakeholders in pursuit, in pursuit of library services and systems that are accountable to community members, particularly those who are most likely to be harmed by these technologies. So it's our time to face our computers and ask those hard questions. So thanks for your time and attention. I look forward to talking with you a little bit in Q&A. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Miriam, for that fantastic presentation. Um, and just a quick reminder to everybody to uh, go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A. Um, I've got a couple um, here that we'll start with um, and we'll see what we can get through um, in the next 20 minutes. Um, excited to continue this conversation throughout the day today. Okay, cool. Awesome. Okay, so our first question um, from uh, Kelly Herm. Um, I'm curious to know why um, all or most of uh, the services uh, speaking about digital assistance use female yeah. voices and likenesses? That's a great question. So um, it, it goes back to the design logics. Uh, there's been a lot of studies that um, people li like are comfortable hearing certain kinds of interactions from feminized voices and then other kinds from male voices in ways that map onto kind of cultural gender scripts. Right. So um, studies showed that like, you know, kind of like mathematical and fact based questions um, are more receptive to men and that men preferred those kinds of questions from male voices and that uh, but things that are kind of more affective and caring and uh, and domestically oriented uh, feel like are, are more culturally accepted uh, by women. So the thing is, is that this gets used as a kind of um, design rule, right? Where they're like, oh, well, people like that, right? And so then it's like, cool, well, we'll design that because that means people will, you know, like our technology and they'll like relate to it and find it friendly and trustworthy. But what happens is now you've kind of hard coded this sex like sexist stereotype, but like now it's like a design rule of user experience. And so it gets hard to break. So I think that there's been, yeah, exactly. So there's, uh, there's been a real pushback of that actually in the last few years with a lot more public discussion because this is very old, like, um, you know, going back to like the first chat assistance and even like the Turing test, like there was a gender bit of it and, um, and, and the, the feminization of it is always there. So now we see like uh, companies responding in kind of different ways. Some are like, oh, well, we'll give you choices then. Like you can choose if you want, you know, like my Siri is British male voice, um, more like a Jeeves, right? And um, so user choice is something that they 
trite that you know is one strategy for that. But uh, if you're if you're a gamer and you uh, play in gaming environments where you get to choose your avatars, um, you'll note that sexism didn't die there. <laughs> so <laughs> that didn't that did not you know 100% solve the problem. But what it but really truly it is around um, the way the design works in conjunction with our expectations that are you know gendered and racialized in different ways in different environments. Thank you. And yeah, Attica says in the chat, a chicken and the egg kind of problem, right? Like, how do you break right. out of it? Um, I was so interested to hear about Audrey as like the great great grandmother of Alexa yeah. or something like that, and um, how far back these kinds of patterns go. Um, all right. So, our next question comes from Stephanie Bean. Um, so, I can understand why many users jump to logical fallacies and the logical anxieties because there isn't much tech literacy. Your note about it being computers, about computers being human all the way to their core. Uh, strikes me as particularly potent. Do you have any recommendations for how we can scaffold up from a basic notion like this to bigger ideas like computational intelligence, big data, machine learning? Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Um, some of the books that I recommended um, are great primers for that. And there's a book that I don't think I mentioned on there, but I'll, I'll say it. It's um, You Look Like a Thing and I Love You. <laughs> but it's like a really nice breakdown of sort of how algorithms work and, you know, kind of walks you through these processes. Um, but, you know, when I teach this topic in class, I pair it with a lot of um, like sci-fi examples. You know, like we, we look at sci-fi examples and talk about the tropes and the themes that we see over and over again, and then go back and look and ask questions about like, okay, well, could could that happen? Like, could the algorithm do this, right? And so like, even, um, even those who are not math inclined and are <laughs> very scared to dive into that situation, there's like, you can get a very base level of the algorithm is a recipe, you know, and it, it can only do these things. Uh, you have to have given this, these parameters and then here are the different ways that that can go. Um, and then, you know, look at how that gets employed in systems. I think that like toggling between like the myth and the reality helps really kind of be like, oh, I see, like that couldn't happen. Like that part's the made up part, right? Um, that jump forward. But you're absolutely right that like in the absence of, you know, kind of like robust education and discussion about that, all we kind of have are, you know, the utopian and dystopian vision and I think it's really hard to even interpret headlines. Like I often have students just like bring AI headlines to, to class for the week. And, you know, they'll say things like new AI can read your emotions. And it's like, it can't, um, it, it, you know, that's not a real thing. Like they can check your mic movements, but do they know how I feel? <laughs> they do not, right? And so even parsing that, I think um, just the news landscape is really tricky because there's a lot of like kind of clickbait claims that are misleading about the technology itself. So, but I, I do recommend the, um, you look like a thing and I love you. It's a really nice, like kind entry. <laughs> um, Meredith Broussard's book too, um, Artificial Unintelligence does that as well. Awesome, thank you. Um, and I, for those of you who didn't see, if you go to the Q&A on the answered tab, you should be able to see a list of those books from um, the slide, and maybe we can send that and some of the other um, things that were recommended during the talk um, out afterwards. Um, all right, um, next question from Abby Mann, who's one of our um, presenters later today. Um, thank you for this talk. I'm interested in the possible tension of uh, those LIS goals you listed between increasing representation of non-hegemonic groups and protecting privacy and reducing surveillance. Is there a way to make data set algorithm more diverse um, without um, mining more data from those communities? That's a really good question and a really tricky one. I think that um, yeah, in some ways, so it's complicated. In some ways, like the visibility is a trap part is real. So there's sort of different layers to it. I would say that when we're looking at things like how classification schemes and, and cataloging have functioned, like there are just some real clear uh, misrepresentations and harms in terms of like how naming is happening and othering happens in terms of what is kind of centered and not centered. And I think that there are ways to, uh, uh, either, I mean, there, there are models that seek to kind of repair that within its system and models that seek, seek to make new systems, right? Like indigenous knowledge systems that are like, okay, we're not doing that, we're doing this. <laughs> um, and so like we have different strategies and I think that they come at it from different places, right? 
Um, and, and in many ways, it mirrors, I think, the kind of political strategies that we find ourselves in, right? Like kind of liberal strategies of working with systems versus like progressive or radical strategies that are overthrowing systems. So some of that depends, I think, on who you are and how you want to engage. But the question about like, you know, uh, without mining more data and being more visible, I find that the conversation coming up uh, in interesting places like in facial recognition, right? Like where we know facial recognition is um, is biased and, you know, reads poorly darker skin tones and leads to, you know, negative outcomes in terms of profiling. Of course, some of the negative outcomes of profiling are because of white supremacy. And so it's, it's not like you fix the algorithm and you, you get rid of the other part. So optimizing facial recognition to read more clearly and read more accurately uh, only makes people more visible to the system, you know, in terms of policing. So who would want that, right? Like, why would we optimize that? Like, throw that away. Like, we just didn't need that. Um, so I do think that there are systems and areas where, um, you know, fixing uh, old language and classification schemes is helpful. Um, optimizing facial recognition is unhelpful. <laughs> so, you know, it kind of depends on the scale you're talking about. Yeah, and I think there's probably something to be said about like who's making those decisions and participating and yeah. kind of solving this, these messy questions too. Um, all right, from uh, Rachel, this was fascinating. Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering if there are any suggestions for how we can get buy-in from university stakeholders as more and more universities begin surveillance of students by tracking their movements and habits in order to gain uh, data for the purposes of establishing the university's worth. Ooh, I think we've all probably run into this one. Uh, oh yeah, for thanks. sure. For sure. Um, and yeah, I'm just kind of checking the chat box too. I wanted to go ahead and give another shout out for coded bias and also acknowledge Abby, your, your comment that yeah, it's complicated. There's also work to making photographing dark skin more accurate. For sure, it is it is complex, right? Um, the who and the why for are big questions on that, you know, uh, for sure, it, exactly. Um, okay, so the question about in, <laughs> university administrators and how we survive, um, <clears throat> late capitalism in the academy <laughs> is a hard one. Um, <clears throat> I don't know that I have uh, neat answers for that. This is where I do think that solidarity um, around organizing in different ways is really needed. Uh, like, I, you know, in Alabama, it's a, a very, uh, you know, uh, right to work state and very hard to, <laughs> to make traction or like the culture is, is hard to get a lot of, um, there, there are unions, but it, it's hard to get a lot of traction on that. Um, but man, is that needed? Uh, because that would be a game changing thing, very different than the culture of Illinois when I was there. So I do wonder if, uh, if, if what we're seeing is that if what we're talking about is just a hard power asymmetry, right, where we can't make the inroads with our values, because the institution's values are so different, then I, I don't know if I see a way around that other than um, trying to actively resist it. And also, you know, invest elsewhere. I mean, invest, invest in communities and, and other programs as you can, right? Like if you can't, if, if that is the brick wall, then um, there are other avenues that you can work sideways with, I think as well. So. Yeah. But we're, if you we're... find the answer to that question, let me know because <laughs> <laughs> that's a hard one. Yeah, I think we're all interested in um, more strategies for building our collective power to uh, kind of enact our yeah. professional values. Um, so I've got a question sure. here um, from Christine, one of our um, organizers. So it wasn't in the Q&A, but um, the Facebook. She cheated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Put it enough time to, to get to ask right. the question. Um, so the Facebook biometric information privacy class action suit is paying members $400 in Illinois in the next month. Do you think these kinds of class action suits will bring more awareness um, to our students of privacy issues or not because they're not um, you know, they've moved on from Facebook um, as a platform. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I feel like it's sort of like two things. It's kind of like four hundred dollars is 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 money, but is it like is paying some people some folks are like, well, pay us for our labor, right? And I'm for in terms of the labor of engagement, but I'm like, but is it but do we want to put a price on that or do we want to hold it to like a higher standard? So I think that like that did bring and does bring some awareness, but it also feels like 
and then they're done, you know, and then they can move on. Like they paid you and now we've moved on. So in terms of like the long-term accountability, I don't know that it holds the traction it needs to hold. Um, yeah, it's a good question though. Cause I think that like the question about how do we hold these, these places accountable um, is really hard. And that's so, it's so distributed. I just don't know that that even makes an impact to them, you know? Right, how much of their, you know, final um, right. <laughs> line is that? Um, okay, exactly. got a qu question from uh, Christopher. Um, do you know if these ethical and deeper questions get brought up in current computer science and engineering programs? Um, or if you have good examples of, of how that's done? Yeah, somewhere? I love this question um, for selfish self-promotion reasons. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I am currently part of a grant an NSF grant that is looking at trying to integrate some of this stuff into um, electrical engineering classes. Uh, that just happens to be who the partnership is with here. And what we have found is that um, in STEM, they do have you know, also um, their accreditation that has things like ethics and, and a part of it, right? But it's very like framed as, um, like your accountability to like the company, like don't steal from the company <laughs> and, and things like that, right? Don't harm people. Yeah, it's like business ethics, exactly. So it's framed really differently. And it's very like uh, in, in a whole class for a whole curriculum, it might be like we had an ethics day and then we did like a multiple choice and then we're done. Um, and so not all of the things that we're talking about can be framed into like the ethics paradigm. But um, the grant that we have is looking is working with a, um, a, a core class in a first year engineering curriculum and making it all about kind of like your social responsibility is <laughs> to not hurt people, right? Like, and, and also look at global impacts. And so we do have a unit about things like e-waste and um, data privacy um, as, as well as like other kinds of harms. Um, and so, you know, we'll see how that goes, but it is really not part of the conversation in uh, an interesting way. Like it's it's very siloed, right? Like I, I we're talking about this. Like I teach LIS students about this, but then like in engineering, they literally are not talking about it, but they're making it right. So the the divide is very clear, and um, and I have feelings too about like you know how do we come together on that? Who should go where? Like we need to be working together, but it it needs to be you know. Um, integrated. <laughs> so anyway. Um, and Maggie, it says in the chat, this is a growing uh, focus of classes at um, their institution uh, on oh, cool. College of Good. Engineering. So it'd be great That's to awesome. hear more about that. Um, and it's also interesting about even like with uh, a lot of, I went to the University of Illinois or an school now, right? And yeah, interested to see how much these questions even overlap within the same school yeah. um, between yeah. the tracks that, that students can take. Yeah, that's um, a good point. All right, so uh, from Holly, <laughs> do you see changes in graduate programs specifically training librarians? Um, so we're on a uh, library school yes. uh, theme. I love that topic. <laughs> um, shifting the conversation to these kinds of topics. I sense within the profession, keeping the real tech related topics is still being uh, kept at arm's length and many librarians, including many <clears throat> of Holly's colleagues, don't necessarily see it as very relevant to library work. Is there a disconnect or gap in professional expectations of what librarians are responsible for? and the information ecosystem that we're facilitating access to. Great question, Holly. Yeah, I think probably yes. I mean, yeah, I think it is complicated. There is still very, uh, I think a lot of schools still have kind of a, smaller schools have a lot of a traditional, more traditional focused curriculum. I know we do, even though that's something that we've, you know, really worked to change and we, it, and it's not absent of technology classes at all, but, um, but it's different when you have um, a really big school, like a big high school, and you have like, you know, tons of faculty and lots of choices, right? So when you have smaller faculty, then sometimes it comes down to like, what do you know, but, but that really is a question of like, what do we think you've got to know, right? And it's interesting to see what that is and like what gets prioritized, right? I think we're having these conversations also with like um, DEI classes too. It's like, maybe we all got to know that, you know, like, so, uh, so trying to figure out what to prioritize, I think is always, contentious and you know people have their territories on that. Um, I will say though that I, I am seeing more integration of these kinds of conversations, certainly with colleagues of peers at other schools, you know, who are doing really in, doing great programming. So I am hopeful that that's shifting. I know that um, uh, 
I know that we're not like I'm not alone in talking about that those kind of issues. Um, but I do agree that students come in sometimes uh, sometimes fearful if they you know thinking they can maybe like get around the technology component when it's like you know like doesn't matter what you're doing like we got to be we got to be literate about that. Um, and sometimes I find too that like there are just self narratives around like what people think they're good at. They may be gendered or informed by other things. You know, um, I certainly was had a narrative of like, oh, I'm not good at math or something. But like in reflection, I don't know why. Like I think I was like tracked out of it. <laughs> so you know, anyway, this is all to say I hope that having conversations that are also more like socially oriented about the technologies can help like get people interested in wanting to know a little more about you know, the technical parts too, because they go together. And, um, and maybe if folks know that, hey, there's like a really rich story around these technologies that like, it'll create some of the inspiration to be like, maybe I can get in there. Cause it's like, you can go to data camp and log on right now and do like a little, like, here's how you build an algorithm. Like we, we could do that, you know, like it's, it's doable for everyone. Awesome. Thank you. And then um, we've got some good conversation about uh, this question in the chat as well, um, how we can bridge that perceived gap as a profession, how can we actually see these kinds of questions as core to information literacy, um, as we live in an increasingly technical world. Um, all right, so we've got a couple of minutes. I'd say we have about question, time for about one more question before um, I hand it back over to Jason. Um, so if anybody would like to be our, our last question asker, um, you've got a chance now. Um, otherwise, um, I will happily take the floor for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will say these were very good questions, so I, uh, I really appreciate them. Yeah, so I, I'll entertain yeah. my own question then. <laughs> yeah, do it. Let's um, do it. But I'm actually, I was interested in your slide about kind of different avenues for advocacy, um, and I'm uh, curious um, to hear what you think kind of our professional associations, kind of spaces like these kinds of conferences, um, ALA mm -hmm. or state associations, like what kind of role they can um, play in the kind of yeah. broader picture. Yeah, totally. I mean, like I said, I think that, <clears throat> I think professional organizations are challenging, <laughs> especially in a field where we aren't like uh, individually accredited by them, you know, like, this, like our school is, but it's not like you passed the bar and now, you know, it's, it's a different thing. Um, uh, I don't have to explain that, we all know. But I think that it does create a different relationship then with the organization. And I know a lot of, uh, I've heard a lot of folks say on the Twitters, uh, things like, you know, remember this is a professional organization that's for libraries, not librarians, you know. And I know that there's a lot of contention around that. So I, I think um, I'm very excited about Emily Drabinsky's new leadership role and, uh, and hopeful that more conversations can start. But I do think that like professional organizations like other institutions are kind of conservative by nature, you know, like they're, sm they're, they're slow to change. Like that's part of the institutionalization of it. Um, in, in conservative in the sense that they are slow to change and, you know, it's like you got to kind of go through the bureaucratic processes. So I think that that can itself be powerful because those processes are very resilient. And if you can get them pointed in the right direction, I, I think that like they can um, have impacts. And I think that we have seen that around different other issues, you know, intellectual freedom issues um, and, and such like ALA maintains, I think, a, a pretty powerful voice in, in different ways. Um, but I think that there are also limits around what they can do for us, right? So this is where I think working on different fronts is important and to kind of understand like which avenues can do what for you and uh, and not expect the wrong thing from the wrong avenue. Like if you think that ALA is going to like change all of its structure and, you know, suddenly like be a radical organization <laughs> that has a union, you know, like probably not tomorrow, you know, so but, but but like take that energy and take that over here. So it's I think it's about working on different fronts, having the realistic ideas about what you can get done in different places and knowing that if we can all get those working together in concert, we might get somewhere more powerful than if not. Awesome, yeah, really interested to hear from uh, folks about how they're encountering uh, yeah. that. Maybe something we can talk about in our um, social cafe during, during the lunch break. All right, so it. thank you once again, um, both for your presentation and for um, your thoughtful answers to these questions. Thank you to everybody who participated and asked these fantastic questions. Uh, I'm just gonna turn things back over to Jason, who's gonna share a couple of uh, logistical um, things before we move into our day of breakout sessions. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you, Sveta. And uh, thank you, Dr. Sweeney, for an incredibly thoughtful 
thought-provoking uh, discussion. I, I, I would really like to see the ties between our technological knowledge and, and, and what we might traditionally think of as library work. Yeah. It's incredibly important. Um, so uh, a couple, one, one thing I, do, I wanted kind of to say for the end here was, 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 a, was a bigger thank you, really. Um, so I wanted to save this for the end. Over the last 20 years, uh, Moraine Valley Community College Library has been leading the summit, this particularly Information Literacy Summit, and has, has recently passed the torch on to us here at the College of DuPage and DePaul University. Tish Hayes, Troy Swanson, and their colleagues at Moraine Valley Community College Library have always put on a wonderful conference, one I have personally attended for the last 15 years. One that has always been the culmination of my academic year and really got me thinking about new ideas for the, for the coming academic year. We wanted to say thank you to them for the decades of devotion to, to this important segment, for our region, and more recently, for the, for the librarians across the nation. Thank you, Tish, Troy, and everyone at Moraine Valley Community College Library. We really do appreciate it, and hopefully we, we uh, keep up with the trends of which you passed on for the last 20 years. Thank you again. Now, that being said, we're going to see some great breakout sessions coming up here in um, the next 15 minutes. I think we have about a 15, 20 minute break. Next session start at 1045. There's the uh, link. I put the link in the chat box for everyone, but I, you probably got a hundred of emails from me. So you, hopefully everybody has the link. If you have any technical problems, email me, come and see, come and see me, email me, and uh, we can get you the, into the sessions uh, if you're having any of those technical issues as uh, the day goes on. Again, thank you, Dr. Sweeney. We really appreciate your discussion. This was wonderful. I think it's a great way to start off the rest of the day. Have a great conference, everybody. Again, let us know. I'll be in the lunchroom so we can socialize and network, whatever you want to do. And uh, we can go from there. Have a great break. And we'll see you at 1045. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Jason.